Welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, brought to you by the experts at Maryfield Garden Center. Join us as we discover beautiful plants, new trends, and exciting ideas for your landscape. So let's get growing together. Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, bringing out the best in your garden. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. I'm Debbie warhurst Cap. And I'm David Yost. And I've got my good friend and colleague, Michael Fay with us this morning. Really glad to be here with you guys. So Thank glad you for you're having here. me. All right. And we're, we're so glad that you could join us this morning because we have a, a great topic today. Um, first of all, Michael has been with us before, and he is normally at our Fair Oaks location. I am. I work the tree and shrub section at Fair Oaks, yes. Yeah. Now, you're here to talk with us about edible landscapes today, and I know that you've been growing and gathering your own food for quite a while. I have been and um, that was probably really my first passion in gardening I would say. Um, you know although I am an ISA certified arborist and know a lot about trees I I really started in gardening by growing my own food and and collecting my own food and trying to figure out what was what was possible to do at home and how I could make it most effective so. Well there's obviously been a, a real interest in that we've seen a resurgence I still say back 17 years ago when I started at Maryfield, I couldn't get enough people to come to the classes for <laughs> for vegetable gardening and edibles and stuff and you had one last week. And Absolutely, I had, the, I had yeah. the best turnout of any of my seminars yet and uh, I really do think David's absolutely correct. There's a, a huge increase in people trying to do their own vegetable gardening at home and it's very exciting. Yeah. That's great. So you're going to talk to us today, kind of cover the whole thing, not just vegetables, but uh, a vegetable lot of Vegetable gardening, and then, well. and then actually that's what I'm really excited about. We have a lot of unique, unusual plants that people would put in their ornamental garden that they would never even think that would be edible. Um, so I'm very excited to highlight some of those plants today. So there's more to eat out there than we think there is. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and please exhibit caution while, that's right, that's right. while experimenting with that. But yes, exactly. absolutely. We'll, we'll get into that a little later. A lot of your favorite ornamentals are, are absolutely edible. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned you were an ar certified arborist. Also, you're uh, a board member of the Northern Virginia Nursery, Nursery and Landscape, Landscape Association. Association. Yes, that's I great. am the current vice president of the association. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Super. Well, we're so glad you're here. Thank you, Before before we get started, want to let you know what's happening at Maryfield Garden Center today. Our seminars are going on as always, and they are great this weekend as well. Uh, today at our Maryfield location, Robert Woodman, who was here last week talk talking about attracting birds and butterflies, is there today at Maryfield talking about attracting birds and butterflies. So we gave you a little sneak peek last weekend here on the show. That's at 10 a.m. It's at the, actually at the Maryfield Community Hall, which is right next to our Maryfield location um, at the intersection of Lee Highway and Gallows Road. At our Fair Oaks location today, uh, gardening trends in 2014. This is really gonna be exciting because Peggy Beer and Stephanie Brock are gonna kinda tell us what's happening, some of the new things that are going to be going on with perennials and annuals and, and that type of thing. So it's it's gonna be wonderful. And then at our Fair Oaks, excuse me, at our Gainesville location, Professor Larry Shapiro will be talking about seed starting, so, which is very important right now because it's time to get started. Absolutely. Okay, all right, and then next week we have three more exciting topics, evergreens, perennials with personalities, and pruning. So that'll be on March 4th. So our seminars continue. If you haven't gotten a seminar schedule, stop by our in, any of our locations, pick up a full copy of the schedule, or you can go online at our, at our website, maryfieldgardencenter.com. So hope you'll attend as many of these classes as you can, because they are fun, they're exciting, they're a great way to learn, and they're free. What and could, they're free. What could be better? A lot of good information for <laughs> a A lot seminar, of great information. Yeah. Um, guys, before we uh, get started, I have one more quick announcement. Something else exciting happening at all three Maryfield Garden Center locations again today. Now, you know you can always come into Maryfield Garden Center and register to win Maryfield gift cards, tickets to see events at the Verizon Center, Wizards and Capitals games, just lots of things going on. So we, that's going on always. Well, today, every once in a while, we have something extra special going on. And so today, we have a drawing going on for Justin Timberlake tickets. So he's going to be at the Verizon Center on Monday night, this coming Monday night. So you can come into any of the Garden Center locations today, register. Um, to win at five o'clock, we're going to take the uh, we're going to draw the the winners, and we'll call you. So leave a good phone number, call you if we can't reach you. Uh, you've got we'll leave a message. Got till noon to, on Sunday 
to, uh, to let us know. Otherwise, we want to make sure to get the tickets to somebody who can use them. So come in and register today. No purchase necessary. Got to be 18 to enter. One entry per customer per visit. Go to each of the garden centers today and put a put a uh, entry in. We'll draw at 5 o'clock today. So Justin Timberlake, Monday night. A little great. added incentive to come That's in. There's right. already so many good reasons That's to right. come to the garden Absolutely. center. That's just one more. All right. So I've got my announcements over. Okay. Let's get started. Well, I think we got a couple of graphics to sort of kick this off. Uh, Mike, can you give us some, an overview of why we want to be engaged with uh, edible landscape? And of course, there are many reasons to um, landscape with edible plants. Obviously, you know, one of the top reasons is because you're intending to harvest your own food and, and know what's going into the food that you're eating and, and that you're potentially producing at your own home. Um, but a, f a few other really great points are, you know, the environmental benefits, um, water quality preservation, soil conservation, that, and those are some things that people really don't think about when you're landscaping with plants that you're harvesting fruit from, that potentially may, maybe you're not harvesting absolutely everything that's dropping fruit on the ground that is then decomposing and adding to the soil profile. You know, over time you're getting a lot of additional organic matter in the ground, so that's a great way for soil conservation. Water quality preservation, that's more plantings that you're you know, filtering rainwater through that then is transpiring and releasing um, cleaner water back into the ground. So you know, all of these other points that people may not necessarily consider that are really valid points and, and benefits to edible gardening. Um, I believe we had another yeah, another it makes slide think a as bit well. About the plant more plants campaign. It's yeah, just, absolutely. Yeah, all the absolutely. benefits of having No plants. matter what it is, I mean whether it be an yeah. edible edible plant or not. Um, energy conservation, you know, the more trees, the more plants you plant around your home, you know, in the summertime, you've got trees providing shade on your home, that is reducing your energy bill. Um, wildlife habitat and pest management are two of my favorite things. People always ask me, well, if I plant fruit trees, don't I have to worry about more pest issues? But in fact, you're introducing a biological factor that then is potentially even taking care of the pest problem that you have on other plants that you didn't even know you had. So sometimes introducing more plants with attraction for wildlife is actually going to benefit your pest management issues. Okay, so it goes well beyond just food on the table. Absolutely, absolutely. And those other points are things that sometimes people may not consider when landscaping. Well, we're gonna start, the fir your first image here is really my favorite of the whole program. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and start Where with that. Where do you see this? The uh, what goes with what, yes. <laughs> PB&J. Everybody knows, peanut butter and jelly. That, so. In gardening, it's a different question. In gardening, you're concerned, okay, I know I want to grow these plants and I want to keep everything organized, but how do I do that? So that's a very important concern when you're starting to landscape with edible plants. You need to know what plants are going to do well with other plants. So nightshades is a great example. Nightshade is a family of a lot of plants we're all familiar with, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. And these are plants that all have similar growth habits that are going to do really well together in the same environment. They have same soil preferences, so I always say this is a great way to get started. Group your plants together that have similar environmental requirements and you'll do well. Um, companion planting is another of my favorite things to do in vegetable gardening. If you've got tomatoes and you want to have good flavorful tomatoes, why not plant some basil and oregano with them? You have to harvest the basil and oregano before they go to flower anyway. So you're going to keep the plants a little bit lower. They're never going to outcompete your tomatoes and eggplants for sunlight. Um, the three sisters. This is something that our, our ancestors and Native Americans did for generations. They were growing corns, beans, and squash together. Corn would grow up as the stake. The beans are going to grow up the corn, and the squash is going to outcompete all the weeds for, for light. And is, it's a, a perfect companion planting situation. And one more picture. And then leafy greens. This is another one. You don't want to compete with your other plants that are going to get taller. I say just go ahead and put all your lettuces, kales, and cabbages in another location. They're going to have similar growth habits and they're not going to get too tall and outcompete each other for light. Yeah, I think those are all great points. Get people thinking outside of just straight rows. But Absolutely. Actually doing groupings. Absolutely. Right. And you know, you can get into colorful combinations with things like your greens too. So it's not just hey, this, we're going to put these functional plants in these locations. This is a scenario where you can still have ornamentally you know, beautiful plants. Great. Absolutely. All right. Well, we've got to take a quick break, and we'll come back with more edible landscaping. Stay tuned.
Welcome back, everybody, to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. Michael Faye is with us this morning. Talk to us about edible landscapes and all the wonderful things we can have in our garden uh, that we can also put on the table. Now, you just finished telling us a little bit about what goes with what and how to group the plants together. And that's a, that's a very important uh, concern to get started with. You know, you want to make sure that you're grouping the correct plants together. Um, the next most important thing is how, how do we get started? What do we need to get started um, if we are going to grow our own food at home? Um, and the, the first most important thing, in my opinion, is, is obviously what you're starting with. So it, it's got to be a good quality plant. Um, here you can see we've got some organic starter plants, tomatoes, um, organic eggplants, organic peppers. It, you know, you don't have to start with something that's USDA certified organic, but that's a preference of mine, and I'm really happy that we have that option at Maryfield. Right. Now, I do want to say this probably, it's, as far as timing goes, you know, we're talking about looking ahead. This is nothing Absolutely. you're going to be it's doing still, right it's now. It's still exactly. a little chilly to be getting in starter plants and for you to be putting your tomatoes in the ground just yet. Um, that being said, we, we were talking about uh, Dr. Larry Shapiro, who's given a, a seminar on seed starting out at our Gainesville location today. So that's, you know, if you, if you are starting your own seeds, now is the time you need to be considering that. If you're not going to start from seed and you're going to start from starter plant, um, absolutely imperative that you start with a good quality plant. Exactly. So we've kind of figured out what we want. And I'm always guiding people when they're getting started in vegetable garden and they say, what do I grow? It's like, what do you like to eat? What do you want to put on the table? Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. And, and for me, it's also a matter of production. I have a very limited amount of space. So what can I actually get good production out of and good quantity of fruit that's going to be cost effective? Right. Um, you well, know, I'm just going to get out of the way and let you kind of go, go through what I know that you were growing in your okay. own yard. Okay. Um, Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, second most important thing, in my opinion, is, is the soil. Uh, and this actually could be even the most important thing. You know, we don't consider what's going on uh, above ground to be a, a response of what's going on below ground. But in my opinion, over 90% of the time, what you've got above ground is a result of the soil. So here you can see, and I'm going to step out of the way a little bit, you can see I've got some of my favorite soil mixes. Um, over on the far side here, we have a Dr. Earth potting mix. And you can see the little bag in the background here. This is earthworm castings. Earthworm castings are a great boost of nitrogen. Um, it's an organic supplement. This is one of my favorite additives to put in with young starter plants because it's not going to burn the root system and you can pretty much pack that plant with earthworm castings when you go to pot it. Um, earthworm castings, because they are organic, are going to break down a little bit slower and not be readily available to the plant right away, but that's great because that's going to eliminate any burn factor. Um, the other three I have here is actually, this is my own mix. So I love to start with humus and then I'll mix in some mushroom compost and the leaf grow. Um, all are organic products, all are fantastic soil mixes and soil amendments. Um, the other thing that I really like to point out about these three soil mixes is that they're all free of animal byproducts. Now, personally, that's important to me. It is not important to everybody. We've grown up uh, using cow manure and things like that for a very long time, and that is perfectly acceptable. I am a vegetarian, and so I tend to try and lean away from animal byproducts in my soil, and I wanted to experiment here and prove that that can be just as successful as many other methods. Um, so obviously the third factor that goes into this here is really the, the work ethic that you're going to put in. The thing about container gardening and what I've done here in front of my own home um, is that container gardening, you are responsible for everything that's going into those plants. They're not in the ground. They are not going to have the buffer of the soil taking longer to dry out. They're above ground. They're experiencing more sunlight, more wind. So they're going to dry out a lot quicker. In addition to that, they've got less soil space. So if you're going to container garden, you have to understand you're going to be checking on your plants every single day. And quite frequently through the summer, you're going to be checking on your plants even twice a day when it's really hot, 100 degrees plus. So those are three things that I think are very important to get started. And if you put everything you've got into it and you've got a great soil and great starter plants and a good work ethic, in the middle of the summer you can be happy and lush in your home just like I am. Not that my HOA loves that I'm doing it on my driveway, but that's where I've got the most sunlight. So that's the reality of it. So that's the middle of the summer. And then come harvest time, I believe we've got another picture. Harvest time, you can start to see we've got peppers coming in, brandywine tomatoes, which is my absolute favorite tomato, 
150 year old heirloom variety of tomato. It's my favorite. It's very sweet, and I think that's the best one. And then the next slide, you can see this is after we've started to harvest fruit. You know, if you've put in that work and you've put in the good soil and you've got all the all of the fertilizer and everything going correctly, then when it comes time to harvest, you're going to have bowls of, of fruit or bowls of vegetables on your kitchen table as well. So you can see here, this is, this is a meal that I've cooked from our garden. Now there are some mushrooms in there. I believe that's the only thing in this meal that I didn't grow at my house. So this is a great meal. You know, I did add rice into it as well to make sure it's a complete protein and it's a well-balanced meal, but this is all from my garden. So this is this is a great example. You know, you don't have to have an entire farm's worth of corn and beans and squash in order to get something that you can make a meal out of in your own home. Even having five or six container plants in front of your house is, is enough to get a meal once in a while and potentially even put together a salad for an entire week. Yeah, and I'm so glad you brought those points up because a lot of us don't have the space and the time and everything to produce, you know, huge quantities. But anything we can do participate in our own food chain is, is just fabulous. Absolutely. Anything is better than nothing. And for those of us who live in townhomes, you really only have that space for container gardening. But it's yeah. still feasible. And I should say, Michael and I, li we live only about two blocks apart. So we're both in townhomes we're right across a, the road yeah, from each other. Similar and stuff. situation, exactly. And this is a side note, but I'm so glad because normally they, they keep me seated at the desk. Every time somebody meets me, the first thing he says, I had no idea you were so tall. And, and you wouldn't and know now actual, either. Right, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But somebody, exactly. another tall person, you know, be on the air with. Well, the, we're going to have to take a commercial break, uh, but when we come back, Michael's got lots of great information for us, so stay tuned. We've got many more gardening tips for you. Welcome back, everybody, to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. Uh, Michael's with us today talking about edible landscaping. Uh, you just gave us a great overview on some of our traditional foods, you know, everything from corn and peppers and tomatoes and lettuce. And uh, all the things that we're used to thinking about as edible foods and, and things that we're used to gardening with and, and gardening for edibility. Um, but now we're going to talk about some more unique plants uh, that will be used ornamentally typically that you may walk around our annual section and find um, that could also potentially be used for edibility. Absolutely. Now I'm going to just kind of interject a little caution here and I say that because, you know, when we're selling Please, plants, yes. you know, we're, we sell plants as edible plants, you know, and those are right. raised with all natural and ready to go home and eat. Absolutely. Some of these ornamental ones you're talking about, we're going to learn. I've been learning that they're edible, but... Uh, right, and, and you need to exercise caution, absolutely. I, I right. may introduce a plant to you that you have been planting for years and say, hey, this is something that's edible, but by all means... Uh, know what you're gardening for food before you just go out and attempt to eat it. You, you need to be absolutely certain that you have the correct plant, the correct species of plant. Um, eating things that you're unfamiliar with is not a great idea. Yeah. As I know, you, you've you been your I own I am an expert thing, in, right, yes, exactly. I am an expert in, and there are many stories if you, there. yes, my wife would tell many stories. Absolutely. So the first plant Delicious. that we have here um, is one of my favorites that I discovered in the tropics is Colocasia esculenta. Now this looks a lot like our typical elephant ear. It is not the elephant ear. Elephant ear is alocasia. So this is one of those scenarios where you need to be a little careful. Don't just go into the nursery and purchase an elephant ear plant, plant it in the ground because I've told you that this plant is edible. The other thing is leaves and stems of this plant are not edible, but the root of the colocasia is actually the edible part, and I believe we have a picture of that as well. So there it is. So this is the root of the colocasia esculenta. Um, this is a very starchy food. This is, um, I would call it similar to a potato for those of you who eat baked potatoes all the time. This is the same type of substance. It's actually even a little bit thicker and if you cook it down it's like mashed potatoes but like I said a little bit more, a little bit more substantial. Um, so colocasia is a great one to grow in the garden. It's ornamentally beautiful. It's got that big leaf texture like an elephant ear. But again, this is a way you can introduce an ornamental plant into your garden. Nobody would ever even know you were a vegetable gardening. And here at the end of the season, when it's time for this plant to go, because it is an annual, it's not going to survive our winter, you can dig up and harvest the, the tubers from the plant. So the next plant we have here um, are two of our favorite flowering plants. You can see the viola or pansy right here, um, and begonias. Begonias are another one that I discovered as an edible in the tropics. I, I saw a gentleman was out in the field and was picking flowers off begonias and he was eating them. 
And, I, and so I asked the person we were with, what, what is he doing? He says he's harvesting candy. So again, um, not to encourage you to go out through the nursery and be our, our Maryfield rabbit, so to speak, and, and munch all the flowers that we have on plants we're trying to sell, but so you know ornamental plants that are possible to be eaten, this is a great one. The flowers are, are great on salads, just as the, the pansy flower sometimes you'll see are now being introduced um, to salads when you go to restaurants. Both great edible plants, very tasty, a little bit sweet, and, and I would say that the begonias are, are similar to a candy flavor. And there are 17 varieties of begonias um, that are edible, which is amazing to me. Strawberries, this is one of our favorite fruits that you buy from the grocery store. This is a beautiful plant. Um, anytime you've got a need for a hanging basket and you want something edible and you say, how can I, how can I get more produce produce production from my own garden, this is a great way to do it. Strawberries are one that I see people grow on the ground. They put landscape fabric down and have to worry about keeping the strawberries out of the soil so that they don't rot. This is a great way to do it. If you need hanging baskets around your front porch, you want beautiful flowers, and then you want some color, you've got red fruit that's fantastic color, and it's, it's another great fruit that we go to the grocery store and we spend money on. So why not spend money on the plants and have endless production on your own front porch? Another one, kale, ornamental kale and cabbage. Um, these are two of my favorites. I see these come in in the fall in abundance and people are planting them because they're, they're great fall color. They'll last through the winter time. Um, this is a fantastic cold weather crop. This is something that when it gets too hot in the summer, you're, you're not going to have this plant thriving. But as soon as weather and temperatures break and start to cool off again, everybody's planting kale and cabbage and collards. These ornamental varieties that are purple are still edible by all means. They are just more ornamentally valuable. So why not use this plant, again, in the ornamental landscape where you want to plant annuals, you want to get some color, but you can selectively harvest from them and say, hey, this is what I'm going to use for a salad today. You don't have to devastate the whole plant. You can just have a few leaves off the bottom of the plant. Here's your ornamental cabbage. Again, fantastic color, really good ornamental value, but edible. So the next picture we've got is uh, another one of my favorites. You can see the bulb up here in the corner, or the corm rather, I apologize for those uh, horticulturalists who are listening. And this is the flower. This is one of the most popular um, flowers that we plant. This is gladiolus. This is one of my favorites. Um, Native Americans used to harvest this corm and, and eat it. Again, this is a starchy food. This is a good food going through winter. They will store extremely well. You have flowers that you, can, um, that you can also harvest for cut blooms. And then you can dig up the corms. And again, you do need to cook these. Um, but when cooked, they're going to be very similar to a potato. A little bit crispier than a potato, but very flavorful. Excellent to put in salads. You can, put the, you can mix them with carrots and other vegetables and make a dish out of that. I think we have a picture of the, of the actual corms. OK. We don't, but this is, this is another one of my favorites. This is um, Comagia, Comagia lectilini, which again, another plant that the Native Americans grew. This is a wonderful native plant. And here we have a picture of the bulbs after they've been harvested and actually washed and getting ready to be prepared. Comagia is actually one you can eat raw. Um, it will be a little bit astringent, so you'll get that feeling on your tongue like there's a little bit of a texture left behind. If you cook them, that'll go right away. They taste kind of like a water chestnut, have a nice crispy feature to them, and are fantastic in salads. So this is a great example. This is where you can have beautiful ornamental gardening. You can have flower gardens, bulb gardens, whatever you want. Use these plants as an ornamental garden and say, hey, this is a way that I can spread around the, around the landscape some more edible plants, not necessarily you know, visual to the public and saying, hey, I'm doing vegetable gardening, or hey, I'm growing beans up trellis. This is a plant that you can put in your garden and have beautiful ornamental value out of it, but also be harvesting for edibility purposes. So this is something that I think is really important. If we are going to get into edible gardening in the future and we are going to have the public making more of a push for growing their own food, we have to know which resources we can utilize and keep things beautiful because landscaping is an ornamental thing. We want to be able to find the healthy balance between both.
Well, Michael, I think this is just fascinating that, that you're finding multiple uses for these plants and the food's out there if you look around. It is, it is, it's yeah. available. Well, I was telling you, I know a little bit of a history buff in reading about the Lewis and Clark expeditions and this is a plant that helped them this, survive the winter. Exactly. They would not have made it exactly. without this and plant. And it's because of that bulb storing so much through the winter time and storing so well. Absolutely. Right. Well, again, we're going to have to take a quick commercial break. Sorry to interrupt with that, but uh, again, stick with us. This is only going to take a minute. When we come back, Michael's got more great information for us. Nice to have you two back from your virtual garden. So really fascinating topic there. That was great. I think it's an important one, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, you want you want people to still be able to garden with things that are ornamentally beautiful and, and landscape their yards how they would normally, but mm -hmm. it's nice to introduce the thought of saying, hey, these plants are edible still, and, and we do sometimes use plants that we don't know are edible. Mm -hmm. And I just have to put it in a plug because that bump shot came back in on the picture of the kumquat. You know, we've got tropical fruit trees available right now today in our greenhouse. Absolutely, and that's, that's a fantastic point. You know, um, one thing that I did didn't even highlight in container gardening is is that that's a great way to grow plants that don't typically grow here. You can bring containers inside your house in the wintertime, bring them back out in the spring and summer. That's perfectly acceptable. You know, I do that a lot at home. I've got citrus trees, mm -hmm. I've got some avocados, so that's that's a great way to do that. Excellent. Well, let's just go back to our pictures. I think we're switching gears again. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Changing directions, let's yeah. see. So first one we have here is uh, blueberry which is a fantastic ornamentally valuable landscape plant. Um, people don't think about blueberries so much when they're ornamentally landscaping, but um, the increased demand for them is fantastic. You know, this is a plant that is going to give you great spring flowering, then it's going to give you a later fruit, which is the blueberry we're all familiar with, and the fall color on blueberries is phenomenal as well. This is a great border plant or a hedge planting. You could even use this as foundation in front of the home. Um, but an outstanding shrub, very durable, really minimal pest issues. Of course, you're going to have to be willing to share with the birds if you don't want to net them, but that's perfectly acceptable. I always say, you know, if, if you're willing to share with um, the pollinators, that's, that's an important thing. And we do recommend getting more than one variety for cross-pollination there. Right? Uh, we do. Now, blueberries are self-pollinating, so in theory, you would only have to plant one. But I do find that the more varieties of blueberries you plant, you get cross-pollination, you get sweeter fruit, you get better production. Um, so yes, I, w I would absolutely agree with that. The other picture that they were just showing um, is a picture of some blackberries and raspberries. I think there's only a few blackberries in there, but um, this is a great point. These are raspberries. Everybody loves raspberries. Um, now pick a spot in the garden that's appropriate for them as they are a thorny plant, but fantastic plant. They've got fall fruiting, spring fruiting raspberries, so you can have raspberries, you know, pretty much the entire growing season from spring through fall. And really, you know, some of them are going to be a little bit later in the spring than others. Some come around Memorial Day time, some a little bit later into, into June and even um, early July. And then you get the gold fruiters that will come in fall. So, Raspberries are another one. You know, you can have raspberries that you didn't buy in the store almost the entire growing season. Um, fig. This is one of my favorite, and this is, this is a fantastic shot of how many different varieties of figs there are available. And I know we carry wow. about a dozen. <laughs> yeah, we carry about a, diff a dozen different cultivars in the store. Um, you know, figs are fantastic. <laughs> figs are a great fruit because you can eat them fresh off the plant. You can put them in salads. You know, you see a lot of brown turkey figs going in salads nowadays. Um, the other thing I love to do with figs is dry them. Figs will store incredibly well. You can go to the store and, and purchase, you know, dried black mission figs or blackjack figs and why not grow them yourself and, and take them and you can set them on some newspaper or on a paper towel or even in a dehydrator if you want. You can bag them yourself and keep mm -hmm. them for as long as you yeah, like great. to. I recommend great. it all the time because to me that's one of the easiest of the fruits to grow and it works. lends Absolutely. itself even to suburban gardens so Absolutely. Well. I mean, figs, Figs are, are mostly carefree. They'll tolerate poor soil conditions. They'll tolerate low nutrition. So it's a no-brainer. They'll tolerate drought even. You could forget about your fig plant for quite a while and then go back and realize you've got fruit on there that's wilted. You give it a good watering, all the fruit perks back up, and you're good to go. Exactly. Everybody knows I always go for the easy stuff, and that's one of that's them. That's my garden, too. If you, can't, if you can't cut it and you're not going to make it through a tough summer, then you're not in my garden. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so here's another one of my favorites that people always are, are astonished that we can grow here, pomegranate. Um, you know, pomegranate was, in my opinion, one of the first highlighted superfoods, and now we've moved on through acai berry and goji berry. 
But pomegranate is a beautiful plant. It's got a great flower. Um, you know, it's, it's a bright orange color, so it's kind of a flower that we really don't have in our ornamental landscapes here. Uh, it's a really attractive small tree or tall shrub. You could get it to be an 8, 10, 12 foot tree. You could keep it as small as 6 if you want to. Um, but pomegranate is that, that plant that, you know, you're going to have profuse flowering on it. You're going to get good fruit production out of it. It is hardy here, and that's usually what really surprises people is that they will grow here. But when you harvest your own pomegranates, I promise you, you will never have one taste any better than that one. Um, grapes. So this is something that's in, very popular nowadays, and you see wineries popping up all over the place. My father-in-law actually does grow his own grapes and produce his own wine. Um, this here is a picture of grapes growing through the, the top of a pergola. So you could imagine, if you're entertaining guests on your back porch and you've got some sort of trellis or a pergola over top, and you have grapevines growing over and grapes coming through. Now, these are green grapes. You can imagine the color and interest that you'd have if they were Concord grapes or wow. another purple. I mean, this is a beautiful ornamental plant that, again, you can walk out onto your back porch and reach up and potentially pick down grapes that you could be eating right there fresh. Or you could harvest them. You could dry them. You could sun dry them and make your own raisins. Or you could, you know, you could press them and, and make wine if you'd like. What a perfect spot to have a wine tasting. Absolutely. They, oh, man. Absolutely. That's underneath good. underneath oh, the yeah. pergola with grapes growing through. Mm -hmm. Here's another one that's increasing in popularity um, as the days go on. Hops. Hop vines are fantastic. They are extremely fast growers. The only thing that I would, I would indicate is very necessary to this plant is you have to get them off the ground. Um, my best friend, my brother, has been growing these in his backyard. In one growing season, he put hop rhizomes in the ground from our store and had them trained on a twine all the way up to the top railing on his deck and got enough hop production that he was able to actually brew his own beer that year with him. Wow, so that's, that's cool. and, and with the increased popularity in, in micro brews and craft brews, this is something that I think is going to become more popular in the future, people growing their own hops to produce their own beer. Yeah. Now, I know we're running short on time, but mm -hmm. we'll just real quickly hit some of these other trees that you brought Sure. In. And here's a, here's a great one. This is, um, you know, the typical fruit trees that you would think of when you go after fruit trees in a nursery. Um, these are just some of the varieties that we carry at Maryfield. And you can see, you know, the names <coughs> on there, apples, apricots. Um, some of my favorites on here that people don't think about are your jujubes and medlars that are extremely durable trees. You know, elderberry, mulberry, pawpaw, which is a great tree in the wild. And again, one that's not readily available in cultivation, but we have a really good selection of them at Maryfield. Persimmon, there are numerous different types of persimmons available. Um, here's some nut trees that we also offer. You know, Allegheny chinkapin, black walnut, Chinese chestnut, hazelnuts, hickory. These are all plants that are going to grow in the native forest. You see your hickory and, and hazelnuts and oaks. These are things that if you want to be harvesting nuts, that even if they're a little distasteful, there are things you can do to make them, make them more tasteful and palatable. And then the next picture we have here is, um, you know, ornamental landscape trees that you don't typically think of as edible edible trees. Um, these are plants that produce an edible fruit or have edible characteristics about them that are extremely beneficial. Service berry being the last one on here, that's my favorite. Service berries, also called June berries, are even tastier than a blueberry and about the same size fruit and just as just as um, fruitful. That's great. Yeah. Now Michael has given us a ton of great information here. So don't forget our we house our shows from each week on our website, MaryfieldGardenCenter.com. So you can go back anytime and rewatch the show. You can see you can see the outline, you can see the slides that And uh, you can come to the nursery and, and visit me and I nursery. can reiterate everything That's right. in person. That's yeah. right. So take advantage of that. Today's show will probably be up later later today. So it's a it's a great opportunity. Uh, and we, when we come back we're gonna take your phone calls. So if you have any questions Questions, give us a call, 703-387-1046. We'll be right back. Hey, it's phone call time, 703-387-1046 is our number here. And gentlemen, our first caller is Jennifer, who's calling from Olney. Hi, Jennifer. You there, Jennifer? Yes, can good, you hear me? Good morning. Yes, How good morning. Doing? How are you? How can we help you? Alumnar apple tree. Jennifer, can you hear us? Jennifer? Oh, I think we may have lost Jennifer. Okay. Hello? Okay. 
We'll try to we'll try to get her back. Um, while we're waiting for another call, you wanted to mention some of the herbs. I did because a lot of what we've been talking about is not quite the season for. But our greenhouse, for example, we've got a fantastic selection of herbs. I wonder if we can bring those over, Michael, because a couple I wanted to well, highlight. Well, I'll tell you what, we can even start with the with the bay here, with the bay laurel, which is my favorite one. Okay. Well, bay laurel, these are obviously little starter plants. They'll get, they'll get quite large, and we all know the bay leaf that we use for our cooking. Absolutely. And it's a great one to go out there in the patio. Being a tree person, that would be my, my right. first so choice. If we bring yeah. this whole little uh, tray over, what oh, I wanted to show off, and there's so many things. Um, but uh, Shirley, who managed our greenhouse, kind of brought this to my attention, wanted me to point out. We have catnip and cat grass as well and that's something we, you know we just can't keep enough cat grass in stock absolutely and cats love cat grass they'll nip it down right down to the bottom of it right so a lot of times when we're trying to tell people to you know keep the pets away from the plants there are some yeah that we encourage a, them. here's a few that are mm -hmm. actually okay for them absolutely okay gentlemen we have a, another caller betty who's calling from falling waters west virginia good morning betty how are you Good morning. I'm fine. I was wondering, we have a paracanta bush in the front of our place, and I think that we've been chopping it to death. I wonder when the proper time is to trim a paracanta. I don't know. My experience, that's a pretty tough question to answer. It may seem simple, but because it, they, they actually produce berries off of last year's wood. It gets yeah, a little complicated. Pyracantha is one that if you're trying to grow it for the flowers and you're trying to grow it for the fruit production because it does bury so heavily, you, you would need to wait until after it's done providing its function that you desire to actually prune it. So after it's done fruiting for the year would be the appropriate oh. time to, to prune it immediately thereafter. The birds have been having breakfast and lunch and dinner off of it. <laughs> well that's good. Then you're getting some good bird, bird watching in, right? Yes, yes, but it just seems like uh, it, it's like it, it's not the right time when we when we trim it. Yeah. And can we? Is it is it bad? Uh, we think maybe we're trimming it too much. Is there such a thing as trimming a pyracantha too much? Well, it could be, Betty. I was going to say. Now they they develop pyracantha develop a little short compressed stem, which we refer to as a spur. And yes. those little compressed stems are the ones that actually produce the flowers and then the subsequent berries. So when you're pruning uh, and you get aggressive, you get all this vegetative growth, but you don't get the formation of those little spurs in there. Oh. So it's, it's, it's one that's it's a little tricky as far as pruning, but if you look closely and try to preserve as many of these little spurs on there, you might get exactly. some better flowering and fruit production out of it. Oh, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, uh, one quick question. Uh, the the plant that's behind the gentleman sitting next to you would that be a banana tree? No, you know, and, and I'm so glad you're the second person that's <laughs> asked about a plant. I'm going to have to confess to you; these are silk plants behind us, uh, so that's not even a live plant back there. But uh, oh, it's oh. you know, I guess it, it, looks, it looks quite like similar a, to banana. I think it yeah, I have a banana tree. I would growing. call it maybe a bird of paradise. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, a little hard I think, to say. I think it's a. a I think it's an artificial philodendron. But we oh do sell banana trees mm -hmm. uh, we when do. they're at seasons there, so, and they're fantastic plants to grow outside. They're a little tough as a house plant. And we just well, I'm growing one from a very tiny little sprout that a friend gave me, and it's, it's getting huge. Yeah, well, I do. thank you so much for your, for your information. Thank you. Okay. Good luck with the pyracantha. Have a great weekend. And we actually have just gotten, I know at Fair Oaks, a large selection of, of artificial plants in, silk plants in, which are gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely hey, gorgeous. If you don't have the light, they're fantastic. They really That's are. Right. That's they right. They really are. Okay, let's see if we can sneak one more caller in before we go. Dottie is calling from Bowie, Maryland. Hi, Dottie. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I enjoy your show every week when I can stay home and watch it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I have a question in regards to lemon tree. Mm -hmm. I started it around two years from a seed. And I was wondering how long it takes to start blooming and bearing fruit. You know, sometimes uh, lemons are actually usually pretty quick. Um, how, how big is the plant that you have now? It's around two feet tall. That's big enough to start blooming and producing fruit. We'll get quite small plants in at the nursery, you know, three gallon containers in the greenhouse that'll only be two, two and a half feet tall and they will flower and fruit in the nursery. So come so this summer, wondering. I should be able to see fruit, huh? Yeah, but if she grows hers from seed, that's why I was wondering if she's growing uh, 
varieties it may take longer. Well, and that's possible. And the, and seeds on citrus are very interesting because if you actually crack the seed coat, you'll see that there's kind of a puzzle piece seed in there. So you may have multiple seeds in one seed coat in a citrus plant. So um, there is potential that whatever fruit production you do get off of it may mm -hmm. not come true to the fruit that you harvested that seed from. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, it, 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 like David said, it could be a variety that takes a little bit longer to flower and fruit, which is quite possible. It could also just mean, mean that you need a little bit of fertilizer or a little bit more sunlight. Do you put the plant outside in the spring and summer? Yes. Okay, I would continue to do that and, and I would expect to see flowers and, and potentially fruit very soon. Yeah, and where I have it in the house right now, it gets sunlight. That's good. Right. That's hard for a lot of people to do through the winter, so you're doing all right. Yeah. Dottie, if you get impatient, come to the garden center and buy one of these compact ones that we sell for home gardens. Good. Yeah. good. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to take a, a quick break and come back with more of your questions. a lemon tree to come back. That's great. Well, let's get right back to our callers. Actually, I believe Jennifer is back. Are you there, Jennifer? I am. Oh, Can right. You yes. Oh, yes. yes. Loud and clear. Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to get back. <laughs> What's your question? Well, I have columnar apples in my yard. I want to know how to make them more prolific. And also, I have maypops. And they're beautiful. They don't flower as much as I'd like, and they don't fruit as much as I'd like. Is there anything I can do with them as well to help them be more prolific? Well, let's address the apple tree first. Um, are you fertilizing your apple tree? No, not as I don't think so. Okay, so that's definitely important. Uh, the more nutrition you can get to the tree, and the more nutrition it can pull out of the soil, the more potential it has to produce fruit. I would focus on high phosphorus and potassium fertilizers because those are going to actually encourage roots, shoots, and fruits. Um, do you How have? How soon should I start that? Um, well, you'd want to start that really in the fall when it's, when it's developing buds for flowering, but there's never a time that's too late. Okay. I like to do spring fertilizing and fall fertilizing for fruit trees, so I would say now would be a great time to be thinking about putting down a spring fertilizer. Okay. Um, do you have multiple apple trees? I just have two. I was concerned. If, it's a small yard, but I wondered if they're too far apart. Are, are they visible from each other? Yes. Okay, so they're probably not necessarily too far apart. Um, is it the same type of apple tree? Uh, they're slightly different. Okay. They're the same. T they're, they're both columnar, but they're uh, one is kind of green and one is kind of red. And I've had them for years, and they'll flower, and you'll get some pretty fruit. Sure. You know, and then the fruit will fall off. Sometimes, okay, fruit falling off sometimes can be a lack of nutrition. It can also be um, experiencing drought through the through the warmer seasons. So sometimes it's it's a matter of supplemental mm -hmm. irrigation. I would say sometimes um, fruit will underdevelop if it doesn't have enough pollination. So sometimes introducing another pollinator apple like Golden Delicious might be a good idea. Okay, so I should probably just get yet another apple tree. Ideally, yes. Okay, and the, and the maypops. I'm, so, I'm sorry, what, what plant is that? Maypops are uh, in, like in south, southern parts of Virginia and different parts of the area. Uh, they're a uh, passion flower. Oh, is it, it is a passion flower? Yes. And are you getting full sun for that plant? Yes, yeah, and all of these plants are in my southern, you know, it's a southern facing yard. Okay, are you getting good flowering off of the plant? Uh, not as much as I'd like. Then I, I would definitely introduce some fertilizer to the mix. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So mine sounds like it just needs more nutrition and water. <laughs> that may be the case, definitely. And you can work on enhancing the soil profile over time by adding organic um, nutrients and soil amendments as well as fertilizing. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Sure. Okay, let's see. Our next caller is CJ, who's calling from Washington, D.C. You there, CJ? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my question is to Michael. Uh, last year, I planted okra, cucumbers, thyme, and lemon balm all in the ground. And, of course, I put down the dried blood because I have a uh, squirrels who okay. love to come and dig up um, and what am I am I doing anything wrong by you know periodically putting the drive around no no absolutely not and um, my soil preference of not using animal byproducts is is a really picky thing that I do and I don't recommend that for other people you continue with your 
with your traditional techniques and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Dried blood is actually um, in many soils and is in many fertilizers and is a fantastic soil amendment. So I, I did not want to discourage you from, from doing something that you're comfortable with that you've done for a long time. You are not doing anything wrong, CJ. That sounds great. Okay, now the other thing is about container guard, uh, container gardening, and because I want to really, I mean, everything that I do, I get the organic plants, and, and I try to, you know, work with things organic. Amending my soil, how, uh, you know, working with the, the container guard, uh, containers, and, but with the soil in the ground, amending it, what, what do you suggest for that? Because when I get prepared to plant my okra and cucumbers and sure. whatever else I'm going to do. Sure. In container gardens, I would say that you do have two great options. You know, there are a lot of ready, ready mixed soils that you can purchase, like our Dr. Earth. Um, mm -hmm. That's a fantastic one. We're also carrying a Happy Frogs um, organic soil for vegetables, which is another great one. So those are, those are soils that you can start with, or you can opt for what I do sometimes, which is make your own soil blend. Okay. You know, all you need is a base soil, like a humus or a composted cow manure, and then mix in a few different soil amendments. Um, leaf grow is a great option, the mushroom compost, bumper crop, things of that nature. But that's, there's nothing wrong with making your own soil mix or purchasing a ready-made soil mix. So whichever you prefer is the way that I would go. Okay, all right. thank you. I'll, I'll see you guys. Great. Thank you very we look much forward for that. Thank you. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Robert. We have run out of time. My apologies to Valerie and Melissa. If you stay on the line, let uh, Diane get your number. We'll have Michael give you a call back um, because we've just run out of time. The hour just flies by. Thank and you so much. Anybody who has questions, come into come the nursery in and, and visit us. We love to talk about this stuff. So absolutely, please. absolutely. Next week, uh, Peggy's going to be here and it's going to be gardening fun inside and out, which is. We'll let you think about that. Be sure to attend the uh, seminars today at all three locations. Sorry you have to pick one, but they're all great. Uh, come in and register for those Justin Timberlake tickets by, the, by 5 o'clock this afternoon. And we hope you have a great week, and we will see you next time. Thanks for being here. Thank you guys for having me.